Well, uh, I am uh, really excited to be with you guys this morning and share about my favorite discipline, confession. Uh, can you tell that I'm lying? It's not my favorite at all. In fact, I don't think a lot of people would be able to say that confession is their favorite discipline. Uh, what I can say is that I have a lot of favorite people in the world, and two of my favorite people in the world are my nephews, Timothy and Ezekiel. I've got a picture of them here from our wedding. Uh, they are two of my favorite people in the whole wide world. They are full of energy. They're a lot bigger than this now. This is from where, when Janine and I got married about six years ago now. And th the reason I love them is because they like to get into all kinds of trouble. And on the occasion of our wedding, when they were over, uh, they were staying with Janine's family at the time. Janine's family had uh, got some room for them, so they were staying in the basement. And in the basement was a pinball machine. How many people could say they have a pinball machine in their basement? Well, while they were staying there, uh, Ezekiel, not Timothy, Ezekiel is going to be important in a second, decided to uh, investigate the pinball machine. Now, the reason most of us do not have a pinball machine in our basement is because they are expensive. Uh, and so you don't really want a toddler digging around in a pinball machine, but somehow Ezekiel, with his toddler strength, was able to pull the front panel off of the pinball machine and was digging around in the wires, pulling on the cables, uh, and pulled something loose. Uh, and so my sister comes in, their mom comes in, she sees Ezekiel there digging around inside this pinball machine of which there's no way she can replace. She's horrified and watching him do it, in the act of doing it, she says to him, hey, who did this? And Ezekiel, without missing a beat, says, Timothy did it and points to his little brother at the other side of the room. Now, we all as a family now remember that my nephew's first words were a lie about his brother, trying to get his brother in trouble for busting up a pinball machine. And he's gonna live with that for the rest of his life. But why was it so hard for Ezekiel to admit what he'd done? Why was his first reaction to try and shift the blame to get it somewhere else? It's because all of us suffer from this terrible feeling inside of ourselves when we do something wrong and we don't want to admit our mistakes, we don't want to own them, we don't want to look at them. Because all of us are born within, within us an innate resistance to confession. Now, as we continue talking about disciplines, I said this morning we're talking about the discipline of confession. And it's a one that we probably have all kinds of ideas about uh, because of the way it's talked about, uh, and some of those ideas are probably not very good. We think about confession as this terrifying thing where we've got to go uh, and tell everybody our deepest, darkest secrets and feel ashamed of who we are and what we've done. But actually, the biblical view of confession and God's hope for confession is something far more beautiful, something far more freeing, and something a lot less scary, I think, than what we make it out to be. Now, if you haven't got to be with us the last couple of weeks and you're wondering what this Disciplines of Grace is all about, uh, I don't want to jump in too quickly without explaining what we're looking at this for. See, the Disciplines of Grace, this series in the summit is all about looking at the practices in our life, the things that we do in our life, to better understand God's grace and his love for us. We have talked about things like serving, we've talked about things like gathering, and we've been talking about the ways in which we can be trained by God's love and grace for us to better understand that and to go deeper into relationship with him and with other people. And so now we come to confession. And God's love and God's grace is actually to give us this gift, give us this practice so that we can better know his love. And a lot of us don't think of it that way, but that's what it is for. Confession is God's gift to us in order to know him better and to live better in fellowship with other people. So today, I really want to dive into this. I want to pull this apart, and I want us together as a church to see the joy of confession, as hard as that might be able to see at the start, at the outset. And I want to talk about the purpose of confession, the problem of confession, and the power of confession. And we're going to look at this by looking at a letter by one of Jesus' dearest friends, a guy called John, who wrote the Gospel of John. And he wrote a letter, and in that letter, he talks about confession. He talks about what it is, what it's for, why we do it. And I want to read that together because I think it will change some of the way we are approaching this discipline. So if you will, would you jump with me to the letter of First John? And we're reading chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. This is what John writes to us. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. 
But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The first thing that we need to talk about as we look at this is the purpose of confession. Why do we do this? Why has God given us this discipline? Now, the thing that I like to do least in our house, because I'm a terrible human being, is to clean it. I don't like doing it at all. There's various things I don't like to clean, mostly because I'm lazy, but also because some things gross me out. Have you guys ever tried cleaning underneath your couch when you have two small children in your house? You will find things in there that scientists will not put in a laboratory. Uh, Usually, when I move the couch in our house, it looks something like this. Uh, I don't even know where that amount of lint comes from. It's like someone shredded a sweater and just stuffed it under the couch. I've found Lego bricks under there that my kids have been looking for for months upon end. I have found peas and sweet corn that have hardened to a state that you, unbelievable. I mean, you could fire it from a gun and it would kill someone. Right? It is a lost land of tragedy and disgrace under there, okay? I don't like going under there. Now, confession is a little bit like pulling the couch away and looking at the things that you don't want to look at. Looking at the places in your life that have things that don't necessarily get you excited, things that are not pleasant to look at. The purpose of confession is to help us to live lives that are not hidden, lives that are open. The purpose of confession is to bring us to God's grace so that things that should be in the light can be in the light. John starts by saying, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. See, Jesus' good friend John wants to paint a picture for us about the God that has given us his son Jesus and about the God who has given us this good message of forgiveness. And the picture that he chooses to paint is a God who dwells in light and in whom there is no darkness at all. And the good news that that God brings, that God that sits in the light is, is that because of his son, we don't need to be in darkness. It's not a place that we need to be in because we have been so loved so forgiven, so fought for by Jesus that it's unnecessary to hide from him any longer. It's unnecessary to keep certain parts of ourselves back because God has already shown us that he's loved us. You see, the reason that we practice confession is not to make God love us, it's because God loves us. And if we, if we start there, then confession is gonna make sense to us. But if we get that wrong, then of course we are never gonna wanna confess because we think it's gonna affect the way that God feels about us. The word that the Bible uses for confess is a Greek word, homo legeo. And it's these two Greek words together, homo and legeo, meaning literally same speak. Homo, same, legeo, speak. And so what it's saying is, is confession is speaking the same as God. Confession is saying the same things as God about our sin. Like it or not, as uncomfortable as it is, there is things in every single human life that are not the way that it should be. We all know this, we all readily admit that there are flaws in all of us, there's imperfections in all of us, there's brokenness in all of us. And confession is the beginning of letting those things come to light. How easy do you find it to say the same thing about your sin as God does? I wish that I could be the perfect pastor and stand in front of you and say, I'm really great at confession, and I always say the same thing about my sin as God does, but it's just not true. I do all kinds of things to avoid bringing to light the things in my heart that I don't want other people to see, that I don't want God to see, See, God says that sin is destructive. He says that it is harmful, that it wounds people, and that it grieves him, yet I fight to keep it in the darkness. Some of the ways that I do that is I minimize sin. I say, well, it's not that big of a deal. You know, it's not really hurting anybody. Uh, I I don't think that it's as bad as, as all that. Sometimes I excuse it. Well, I'm under a lot of pressure right now. Things are really hard in life. I'm just... This is just one way that I can kind of keep myself going. 
Or I was provoked. What, what about what these people did to me? Doesn't that make my sin okay that they sinned against me first? Sometimes I postpone confession and I say, well, it's not an appropriate time. It's not really a good time in my life to start digging through all this stuff. I don't want to look at it right now. It wouldn't be helpful to other people, really, for me to get through it. So maybe I'll just, I'll just hold off. I'll confess it at a later time when it's more appropriate, when things are right. Sometimes I justify it. Well, I, d- I deserve this, okay? I think it's okay for me. It's, my circumstances are different. It's, it's not like this guy over here, or it's not like it was back then, or it's not this, or it's not that. Or sometimes I pass the book. Well, I, yeah, I'm pretty sinful, but what about this guy over here? Right? Have you seen what he did lately? Have you seen the things that he's been saying? Sometimes I'm vague or I rename it. It's not, a, it's not a sin, it's just a bad habit, it's a vice, it's a struggle. None of this is saying the same thing as God about my sin. None of this is true confession. It's not bringing sin to light and calling it what it is. And really, we've been suffering from this kind of problem since the very beginning of human beings. If we go to Genesis 3, well, this is what we read in the, in the first few moments following sin. We see in Genesis 3, 6, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and the tree was desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate and she also gave to her husband who was with her and he ate. And the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. The first symptoms of sin in the world was that people hid. They hid from one another and they hid from God. As soon as Adam and Eve realized what they've done, they put together these fig leaves and then they run and hide from God as if hiding from God is an option. God shows up afterwards, he comes to them And because he's God, he knows exactly where they are, but he asks a really odd question for God to ask. He says, where are you? Now, whenever God asks a question in the Bible, he's not asking because he doesn't know. He's asking for our benefit. What God's trying to do is he's trying to say to Adam and Eve, look at what you're doing. You're hiding from me. You're hiding from the Father who loves you, who made you to be in relationship with him, and you are withholding yourself from me, and you're withholding oneself from one another. This is one of the greatest tragedies of human history, that because of sin, people now hide from one another and that they hide from God. Two people who were in perfect communion with God and with each other, two people who were loved, and in the moment of their failure, the person who cared about them the most is the very person that they hid from. And confession is our weapon against being in darkness and hiding from God and from each other. One of the most beautiful parts of Genesis 3, in the midst of all that tragedy, is that even though they tried to hide from one another and hide from God, God sticks by them. Sometimes we think of Genesis 3 as horrible, that God's really mad with them, and he kicks them out of the garden, and he's kind of done with them. But this is what happens in Genesis 3.21. Before they've even left the garden, the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. In their sin, when they were trying to hide, God exposed them, and then he covered them. He found out where they were hiding, he pulled them out of it, he told them what had really happened, and then rather than turn his back on them, he actually, through his own work, through his own effort, covered up their sin, clothed them, took away their shame, provided for them. See, it's not a bad thing for sin to be covered, it's a bad thing if we try and cover it. It's God's job to cover sin and forgive sin and to rescue us from sin. It's not our job to take that responsibility on ourselves. God isn't asking us to confess our sin to shame us. He's actually asking us to confess our sin so that he can rescue us from shame. So why do we struggle so intensely with this discipline? Why do we have such a big problem with confession? So let's talk about it. Let's talk about the problem of confession. Now, when you work with middle schoolers, you come across a lot of different fads and popular things uh, that just seem idiotic, to be honest. Uh, And one of those that does not seem to be dying out is Snapchat. I have many, many feelings about Snapchat as an app, 
but I thought, you know, I want to be a good middle school pastor, so I'm going to do some research with a very qualified colleague of mine. And so this is my research into Snapchat right here. <laughs> we decided to, to test it out, to see what this was all about. Now, Snapchat, the beauty of Snapchat and the reason why students get so much into it is it's got these things called filters and lenses that can change your image to look like one of a thousand different things. You can, uh, you can actually make yourself into an ostrich. Whoever suggested that needs therapy. Why are they putting that as a Snapchat filter? I don't know. I don't know. But you can turn yourself into all manner of things. You can have a one that makes you look slightly prettier and glossed up. There's ones that can give you a hairstyle, which is really good news for me. There's all kinds of things that you can do on Snapchat. And Snapchat is popular because it lets you create an image for yourself. It lets you be who you want to be. It lets you appear the way that you want to look, the way that you want to appear. And the problem with confession is that it, it does away with filters in real life. It does away with the things that we use to hide and to cover ourselves up. And so we lose control of who we get to be in the eyes of God and other people. And we like to retain control. We like to think that we're in charge of how God sees us and how other people see us. John says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we will have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. The problem with confession is it requires us to let people see the deepest parts of who we are. John's point here is, is actually really hopeful. If we walk in the light, then we can have fellowship. If we are in the light as he is in the light, then we will have something good, something wonderful, something pure, something to be enjoyed. We won't have a barrier in our relationships with other people and with God. See, walking in the light doesn't mean living a sinless life. It's really important that we get that up front. It doesn't mean that we are perfect. What it does mean, though, is that when we are imperfect and we make mistakes, that we own that, that we see that. Yet we fight to stay hidden and control what people see. Some of us, even in church, amongst other Christians, amongst other people that know the truth, that God loves us and forgives us apart from the things that we've done, we hide behind these masks. We create these Snapchat filters to be the kind of people that we think other people want us to be or that we think God wants us to be. And it's a huge problem in churches to do this. It leads to all kinds of tragedies. In the Chicagoland area, there's been no shortage of stories recently about pastors who have fallen into all kinds of sins, things that shock us and stun us, teachers that we have looked to, to tell us about Jesus, and we find out that they are not who they have claimed to be, not who they have portrayed themselves to be. I think it's because confession was not an important part of their relationship with God and with other people, because they were terrified of letting people actually see what was really inside of them. When it comes to confession, we actually, I think, find it easier to go to God than other people as well, which is a strange thing. And uh, German pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer, when he's thinking about this problem of going to God rather than to other people, writes this. He says, why is it that it is often easier for us to confess our sins to God than to a brother or sister? God is holy and sinless. He is a just judge of evil and the enemy of all disobedience. But a brother is sinful as we are. He knows from his own experience the dark night of secret sin. I think Bonhoeffer's point is that there should be a level of comfort we find in confessing to our brothers and sisters in Christ because they know what it's like to be in the same position. They know what it's like to suffer from temptation and brokenness and mistakes and weakness. Bonhoeffer goes on to suggest that maybe the reason we prefer going to God it's because we're not going to God at all. We're really, we're just going to ourselves. We're going into a room and quietly confessing to God when in reality we are confessing to ourselves and we're absolving ourselves of sin and that's so much less than what God wants to do for us because God's forgiveness is real. He wants us to experience it. He wants us to taste it and know it and we can't do that if we are not being honest with him and with others. We need more than that. That's why James, the brother of Jesus, writes in his letter about confession, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. 
You will actually better experience the mercy and grace of Jesus for you. You will better experience the love of God for you when you confess to your brothers and sisters. When you bring your sins into the light with fellow believers. I think that we need to have eyes to look in when we confess so that we can see God's forgiveness. Bonhoeffer writes again, a man who confesses his sins in the presence of a brother or sister knows that he is no longer alone with himself. He experiences the presence of God in the reality of the other person. Bonhoeffer is saying, you will know God's grace and forgiveness when you confess to someone else because you'll see it happening in front of you. It won't be hidden away where you're just hoping that he forgives you. You'll be able to have a real conversation and see it. You experience God in the reality of the other person. It's a grace to us to be able to share our sins with one another, as awkward as we think that that actually is. That's why John writes that we have true fellowship when we confess our sins, because we are able to know one another as we really are. We're able to let people in the deepest parts of who we are, see everything about us, so that when they love us, and ultimately when God loves us, we know it's even in spite of everything that is within us that we don't like. If you are only willing to share so much of yourself, you will always suffer from the question, what if they knew this? And God wants you to be free of that. He wants you to know the power of confession. John goes on to say, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, If we say the same thing about our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The true power of confession is that it is God's pathway for you to know how much he loves you. Confession is the pathway for you to know God's grace so that you can taste it, know it, live it. Again, it's important to remind you, confession is not a discipline we practice to make God loves us, it's because he already loves us. By confessing, we can see that he loves us apart from the things that we've done. The whole gospel, the whole message of Christianity is built on the premise that every single one of us, no matter who we are, have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is something dark in every single heart, which means that we shouldn't be surprised when we find sinners in church. Unfortunately, we are too often. Someone actually confesses their sin and they're like, oh, oh my gosh. But we should be ready to accept, ready to receive that every one of us have things that we need to bring to the light and deal with in the presence of God and find his love for us in spite of them. So many of us have been masking and hiding that when someone finally reveals himself or even when we finally reveal ourselves, we don't know what to do with it we shouldn't be. As John says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. We will never know the love of God rightly if we don't understand that we have something that needs to be healed. We've not yet understood God's love as he wants us to if confession seems like something that we shouldn't be doing or can't do. When my son Jonathan falls and scuffs his knee, his instinct reaction every time is to say, don't touch it, don't come near me, I don't want you to look at it. Actually, even when we're putting him in the bath, he's like, is my knee gonna be okay? And he covers it up and he doesn't want the water to touch it, he doesn't wanna get anywhere near it. And I think probably all of us who have kids have seen a kid react that way. Even if you don't, you've, you've seen a kid at the playground who falls, hurts his knee, and he doesn't want anyone to touch it. But the only way that my son Jonathan will learn that actually I love him and want to clean that. I want to help him, I want to get rid of it because his pain is my pain. I don't want him to hurt. The only way he learns that is if he lets me touch it, if he lets me get near it, if he doesn't hide it and withhold it from me. See, that's why confession requires faith. It requires grace on the front end to wear because we have to believe. We have to believe when we come to confess that God is good, that God forgives, and that God accepts people not based on their record, but on the blood of Jesus alone. The blood of Jesus alone. How do you think God sees you? If you were alone in a room, no one else there, 
and you would ask yourself that question, how does God see you? I bet too many of us would say, well, I think he loves me, but he's really disappointed in me, or he's really frustrated with me, or he wishes I could just be a better version of myself. That's not what God thinks about you. That's what you think about you. If you are in Christ, then the Father looks at you as if you had no sin. I know that that's shocking, but that's why the Bible says that the gospel is is an offense to people. People don't get it, people didn't like it. At the time it was shared when Jesus said these things, people were offended by it. Because what Jesus is saying is if you are found in me, if you trust in me to be the sacrifice for your sin, then God does not see your sins anymore at all. He just sees Jesus. We need to believe that God desires good for us. Not to shame us, not to hurt us, but to heal us. God doesn't want you or I living in chains from all the things that are unconfessed that we are fearful of. He wants to remove its effect on our lives. When I was in my early 20s, if you saw me, I I think that you would think I looked like I had most everything together. I was a good Christian, I was doing all the things that good Christians are supposed to be doing. I was reading my Bible, I was involved in a church, I was in a small group. Uh, I was trying to be who everybody wanted me to be. But beneath the surface, there was some serious stuff. There were struggles that I had, temptations I was fighting, sins that I was falling into that were not okay, that were becoming a barrier between me and God and me and other people. And I fought with everything I had to hide it, to suppress it, to make sure no one found out because I liked people to look at me the way I wanted them to look at me. I wanted to be in control of how other people saw me. And though this is an illusion, I thought I was in control of how God saw me. Well, as long as I'm not talking about this stuff in front of other people, then maybe God just sees the good stuff that I'm doing. But that's as silly as what Adam and Eve did in the garden when they were running hid. I was struggling. And I reached a point where when I was alone, I felt like a fraud. And I was a fraud, I was a hypocrite. I knew that being a Christian meant I had to deal with my sin, but I was afraid of it, terrified of it. I'd gone too long with my mask on. All I could think about is what it would cost me to be honest about my sin. What are people gonna think about me? What are people gonna say about me? Will I be able to still be part of the small group of church? Will I still be able to be part of the church? Now one night, by the grace of God, I was reading my Bible, which you should never do if you have unconfessed sin, because God's gonna make you talk about it. Reading it there, and I felt the Spirit of God in a way that I really have never felt before. And I knew in my heart, it it suddenly became real me, I have to go and deal with this. I have to tell someone, I have to get this out. And I wrestled with God for a few hours that, that night saying, no, that's not gonna happen. We're not gonna talk about this. I don't want other people to know it. Let's just move on. And I played all those games that we talked about at the start. I postponed, I excused, I justified. But God said, no, son, we're gonna talk about it. And so I eventually went to see a good friend of mine who loved Jesus, who I was walking with at the time. And I confessed to him the things that I was struggling with, the things that I was wrestling with, the sins that were hidden in my life. It was humiliating. I felt this image that I'd created for myself just crumbling, shattering into pieces, and I realized all of a sudden I wasn't in control anymore. I was no longer in control of how other people saw me and how God saw me, and I was terrified of it. And to add to it, my friend said, actually, I don't want you to stop with confessing to me. I I want you to come together with a small group of, of our friends who know you, who love you, who you're in close community with, and I want you to tell them. Tell them about what you've done. I was like, man, I've already confessed. (laughs) But we went ahead and we got together as a small group. We sat down and somehow I managed to find the courage, again because of the grace of God, to share what had gone wrong in my life. And again, felt the image just shriveling up. But something happened I didn't expect after that. As soon as I'd finished, that first friend came and he put his arm around my shoulder He stood up in front of all of the people that were there. It wasn't a huge group, but it was enough to make it very unpleasant. And he said, 
Jesus Christ has washed his sin as far as the east is from the west. His Father in heaven does not see his sin anymore. It doesn't exist. It's been paid for on the cross. If God finds no fault in Andrew, it's inexcusable for us to find fault in Andrew. He is forgiven. And as tears started to come down my face because of how shocked I am that this is the reaction of people when I actually confess, everybody came forward to pray for me. My brothers came forward to pray for me that I would know how much God loves me, the height, the depth, the width of his love, that all he has ever seen in me is a son that he wants to heal and redeem and rescue. I found out about the power of confession that day. I realized that God's love for me had nothing to do with how well or how not well I was living up to some standard of holiness. It was to do with the blood of Jesus, and that's it. That's it. We as Christians need to believe and know the joy of being loved apart from how well we have done as people. We should be judged by how well we've done as people. We should be held up to the things that we've done wrong, but the grace of the gospel is we will not be. You will stand before Jesus loved as a son of God because of what he has done, not because of what you have done. And that is why you are free to confess. That is why you are free not to hide because God has already seen it and he has already dealt with it. The only people left to deal with it is us. We are the ones that are still holding on to things that don't need to be held on to. God wants us to know the kind of love that can only come through confession. Let me finish by reading a quote by a guy called Richard Foster who wrote a book called The Celebration of Discipline. And when he's talking about confession, he says, the discipline of confession brings an end to pretense. God is calling into being a church that can openly confess its frail humanity and know the forgiving and empowering graces of Christ. So here's our spiritual challenge for this week. We've been looking at things that we can do to practice these disciplines each week. This week, end each day with a time of confession before God by praying following selections from the Psalms. First of all, go to Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24, and pray this. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Write down in a journal the things that God brings to light in your heart, the things you're afraid to look at. And then go to Psalm 32, verses one and five, and read this. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Let God remind you this week of how confession is not to shame you, but to free you from shame. It is not to harm you, but to heal you. I'm gonna pray now, and then as I pray, Miles is going to come forward and lead us in one more song of worship. And I would love for us to reflect on this, to let God do some work in our hearts and consider his great love for us. Would you pray with me? Father, I openly commit, uh, confess to you this morning that I am still afraid still afraid of confession because of the things in my heart, the things that still come up. Lord, no matter how long I've been following you and how well I seem to have it together, there is always things within me that I feel uh, I can't show. But God, that's because I've forgotten how much you love me, how you have already dealt with my sin and I am free to show it to you and to others because of the love that you have already shown me on the cross. Lord, I pray for us as a church that we would become the kind of place we talked about in the air in the end, a place where people are free to show themselves and know your love for them. We pray this in the name of Jesus, amen.